Hello, I hope you're doing fine. So today I'm gonna finalize the module on identical particles by talking about solids and the origin of their band structure. Um, so let me share the screen in order to set up uh, the lecture. Okay, so last time we started this discussion about solids where we talked about a very simplified model which is basically the free electron gas model of Sommerfeld, where essentially there are no potentials among electrons or electrons and nuclei considered. And the only force or potential over the electrons in the solid is uh, the boundaries, which doesn't let the electrons exit. But except for that, there are free particles. Um, in this case, we're going to still neglect the repulsion between electrons. But we are indeed going to consider um, the interaction, uh, which is of attractive nature between the electrons and the nuclei. So um, that's basically, well, it's a periodic theory because we have assumed, as you remember from last lecture, that the nuclei are situated in the solid in this crystal lattice structure. So those periodic considerations related to the position of the nuclei and the associated periodic potential will give rise to Bloch's theory and uh, the prediction of a band structure which can be qualitatively studied even for a simplistic potential between electrons and nuclei. So, okay, I have set up the topic. Let me start. So again, I mean, we're gonna call it for the moment Bloch's theory. You'll see why it's essentially because Bloch approved a theorem um, related to the form of the solution to the Schrodinger equation under periodic potentials. But in this theory, as I mentioned, we're gonna still neglect the repulsion between electrons, but we're gonna start considering the attraction between the free electrons uh, that move over the solid and the nuclear, which we have assumed fixed in a crystal lattice structure. So, um, Look, uh, what we are trying to do is to basically present qualitative features. Um, and instead of perhaps considering a 3D uh, problem as we did last time in the simple free electron theory for like electron gas uh, uh, model as in Sommerfeld, uh, we're just gonna assume a 1D uh, structure like basically for the lattice. So essentially it's as if you consider just a chain of atoms, right? So um, they are all along one dimension or one direction. And uh, for the width and height, you have essentially one atom and you don't have the other dimensions. So I know it is physically a simplification, but we still will be able to learn some features about this. So we have one direction along which uh, the atoms are aligned, particularly the nuclei which are evenly spaced by assumption. And well, because uh, they have these even spacing and for the moment think of an, an infinite lattice just because the number of atoms is basically of the order of Avogadro's number. So we'll explain later how to overcome this kind of assumption. The main point is that because the nuclei are evenly spaced, the potential that they produce is periodic. And so basically, if you move by A, the potential that you feel is the same. Now, what I'm defining as A is the distance between the nuclei in the 1D lattice that I have considered. So the important point is that Bloch uh, proved the theorem for periodic potentials of this kind. So basically, if you look for the solution to Schrodinger equation, as we already know, this is our equation. The actual form of the solution can be expressed as satisfying this equality, where if you evaluate the wave function at x plus a would be what you would get when you evaluate the wave function at x, but you pick up a factor which is exponential of iqa, where q is basically a constant, which is in the sense of being independent of x. Although, of course, it could depend on the energy given that you're having this, right? I mean, the energy appears here. So what we're also going to show, uh, because we're going to do the proof of uh, Bloch's theorem, 
is that Q is a real valued constant. So let me state more carefully uh, block theorem and what it states and uh, the proof of this proposition. So in 1D, because you could have equivalent um, uh, basically proofs of the theorem in 3D um, is the following. So the block theorem in 1D is that if uh, the potential is periodic uh, with period A essentially, so B of X equal to B of X plus A, then the solution to Schrodinger's equation with this potential can be written in the following form, uh, which is basically that the wave function is equal to a periodic function of period A as well, times uh, this phase factor of exponential of i q x and uh, q is uh, this constant. We're showing the proof that is a constant and actually that it's real. So after I finish the proof, what I will do is to show that this implies this form. In fact, these two formulations are equivalent. I'm not gonna dwell too much on the equivalence, but I will prove this and then from this equation, prove this other one. So here goes the proof, right? After having stated it here. So, okay, we know that the potential is periodic. So by invariance of the translation, meaning that basically translating lattice by A shouldn't change your measurement due to periodicity, we would have that uh, the following observable, which would be the density, would stay the same by invariance of our translation. So I move by A, essentially, and the density that I would uh, see is basically the same. So given invariance of our translation, I would have still uh, basically the same result for the density uh, by moving by A. So that is a result of the norm uh, squared of phi, right? Of, uh, of size or the wave function. So that would mean if I relate actually to the wave function at x and x plus a, they are different by a factor where the factor is of norm uh, one. So essentially that's indicating that there's gonna be a phase factor, right? And that phase factor, uh, because the norm of c is one, is gonna be of the form of a complex exponential of, uh, well, I can write it in this form where Q is basically any arbitrary constant. I'll explain in a second. And well, we want this C of B uh, to be norm one. So I have this term I, which is uh, our known imaginary number. So that means that all this QA factor must be real in order to have actually C of norm one in B. Um, so I just introduced the A for simplicity for later calculations, but I mean, it doesn't matter too much at this point because Q is arbitrary. The only constraint that I have to put is that Q has to be real so that QA is also real and therefore C is a complex exponential and has norm one. So after having introduced this, uh, basically I go back to this equality, right? And I essentially pass the C to the other side. And so that means that uh, the wave function at X is exponential of, uh, minus I QA times uh, the wave function at x plus a. That's basically just passing c to the other side. Now, uh, it might not be clear where I'm going, but if I actually multiply by a factor of the form exponential of minus i q x, I can actually regroup many things. And so let's multiply that, right? I mean, on uh, the left-hand side, I would have this. On the other, I can group the exponential factor that I'm introducing with the other exponential factor with qa and I will have this. So now this is interesting because what this is telling you is that you can define a periodic function of this form. Basically, if you define the function u with parameter q of x equal to exponential of minus i qx times uh, the wave function at x, what you can conclude is that this function is actually periodic because basically you would have u q of x over here and here you have on this other side, uq at x plus a. So that is basically the proof that this new introduced function is periodic with period a. And we can reinterpret some of the results that we have above uh, basically um, 
by uh, expressing our previous equalities in terms of UQ. Uh, because, well, if I basically pass this one to this other side, what I have is that the wave function is equal to this periodic function, UQ, with period A, times this phase factor exponential of I QX. I have established already that Q has to be real. And uh, it's clearly independent of X, of course. Um, we still have to give more information to determine actually that will um, appear once we define more the periodic potential, but never mind. I mean, at this point, this is all what we wanted to prove for Bloch's theorem. So the conclusion is that when Schrodinger equation is a problem with a periodic potential, the wave function can be anticipated to be of the form of a periodic function times this phase factor, right? Which uh, is a complex exponential actually. So it's not that the wave function is completely periodic because you still have this phase factor, but for what matters in terms of the density, that's an observable that would indeed be periodic. And I mean, at least one of its factors, it's periodic indeed. So though it's again, not completely periodic because you have this complex exponential factor. So, okay, what I'm gonna do is to use this in order to prove um, the other stuff which might be more useful for further analysis. And well, um, basically, how do we go from this result, oh, sorry, from this one to what we want to prove? It's actually not too complicated because I only need to evaluate um, at X plus A. So if I have this, let me evaluate at x plus a, right? So I mean, then at x plus a, I have the complex exponential evaluated at x plus a times uh, uq of x plus a. Now, uh, well, this function is periodic, so that is equal to uq of x, and this other part can be decomposed. So one of the factors leaves out as a constant, then you have this other part, and the important thing is that these two are the components of the wave function as we had proved before. So actually I'm kind of like indeed using the periodicity and this combines into the wave function psi and therefore evaluating at x plus a the wave function is equal to evaluating at the wave function times this um, complex exponential factor E of I Q A. So um, this is the form that I wanted to, to prove. And I have used the periodicity of U Q. Actually, I mean, this is not perhaps in the scope of this lecture, but you can prove that this is basically an equivalent formulation of Bloch's theorem or the result of Bloch's theorem, that from this, you can also prove uh, the equality that we obtain in the theorem proof. So, but I um, mean, that's not too important. Uh, we're in, this is not a math course, and this is just what we want, although the implication goes in both sides. Um, of course, uh, in order to justify invariance of translation uh, fully, one would need an infinite, uh, basically, lattice in 1D. So that's not too realistic, but uh, you have to consider two things. One is basically an approximation. The other is a physical device in which the invariance of translation would hold. The first one, which is the approximate, is that basically you have a nuclei of the order of Avogadro's number. And so the effect that, let's say that you have an electron in your lattice, it's only gonna feel the effects of the nuclei that are closer. So for practical effects, the nuclei that are far away do not have too much impact on the electron. And so the result that you would expect from a lattice in 1D with a large number of atoms, but finite, will then be too different from the case of the infinite lattice. That of course, it's approximate, it's not exact yet. I mean, it's a reasonable approximation, but if that still does not satisfy you, what you can do is essentially bend the 1D lattice as making it as a chain that is circular. So in that case, what you're having is this uh, circular lattice chain which is indeed periodic because although it's made of a finite number of atoms, it's basically um, concatenated among itself. So there you do have invariance of translation as in any periodic problem, um, at least 
over this small superior a, right? So, okay, the second comment is basically that there is a physical setting over which the embarrassment translation holds and the conclusion of, uh, of Bloch's theorem for periodic potentials would hold. I mean, if you have basically a nuclei uh, arranged in this circle, the space evenly with distance a, it's clear that the potential has to be periodic because the atoms and the nuclei are arranged uh, in particular periodically. So in that case of the circular chain, which for hypothetical purposes and maybe for peace of mind, I'm gonna entertain. Um, and well, we have boundary conditions where basically we concatenate the first with the last point, right? So you have this cable and you join the left endpoint and the right endpoint together. So that would be the resulting boundary condition that basically under the periodic boundary condition in 1D, the value of x would be equal to the value at x plus n a, where you have n nuclei and the spacing between them, between two of them is a. So that's basically the distance between the first and the last without double counting. And again, uh, n is basically the order of Avogadro's number. Um, again, it's up to you to choose which one is more intuitive, if it approximate uh, thinking or this uh, circular lattice, but um, under the assumption of the circular lattice chain, um, uh, in addition of holding the embarrassment translation, basically you still have the conclusion of Bloch's theorem. Um, and the second equality that we derived, which was this one. And uh, well, uh, what we have learned from that uh, corollary is that if you translate by A, you pick up a factor of exponential of pi QA, right? So the wave function is not completely periodic, but I mean, uh, the densities, and if you move, you only pick a complex exponential factor of norm one. And so what would happen if you go basically um, translating by NA, right? So you would apply essentially the translation in times. And so that would get you that um, the wave function at X plus NA would have this factor in times and that's why you have exponential of i and qa times the wave function of x. Now, uh, that is basically using the result from Bloch's theorem in times, but you have to introduce also the periodic boundary condition. So because you know that psi of x is equal to psi at x plus na by periodicity in 1D for the circular lattice chain, um, basically you have that psi of x, which is equal to psi of x plus na is equal to the exponential in times so that's where you have this factor. And then psi of x. And so what you can do is eliminate the wave function. And that means that this exponential of i and qa, so the exponential phase factor in times, is equal to 1. And so that's a good result because it um, establishes at least the null values for q, which at this point we have only established that it's real. So that means that then qa has to be of uh, the form of 2 pi n with n, any integer number. Or equivalently, if I pass uh, an a to the other side, excuse me, basically q is of the form two pi divided by a times n over n, where n is an index that can be zero, plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, etc. So, I mean, we have determined up to a point the possible values of q. Um, so also another important conclusion is that essentially we only need to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation in the interval zero A because Bloch's theorem is telling you what is the form for the joint intervals, right? If you translate by A or by minus A, you will only pick up a phase factor. So it makes sense to actually just solve the Schrodinger equation in uh, sub interval zero A and then just keep in mind that translating picks up phase factors of this form. And so that's what we are kind of going to do um, in the following. Uh, so, uh, so far we have made very general considerations just by assumption of a periodic potential, but we haven't given any form. Um, I must mention that if you were to take a course on uh, atomic physics and condensed matter, uh, you would usually see the most typical uh, models for uh, the periodic potential in the situation that we are. 
One of them is the chronic penny model, where uh, essentially you have this periodic potential, which looks like uh, these sort of square functions uh, with some periodicity. Um, so they have some rectangular jumps uh, indicating the effect of the nuclei in the periodic potential, but we're not going to do that because, I mean, at the end of the day, this is not a course in atomic and molecular physics. We only want to show the effects of a periodic potential and how uh, band structures in solid can arise from that. So we're going to use an even simpler model, though that is one of the classical simple models, which gives good results. Um, uh, we're just going to use what they call the Dirac comp, which is basically a periodic array of Dirac delta spikes. So if you want a figure, I can show you the Griffiths illustration. This would be basically the Dirac comp. Um, so this is in the book of Griffiths. So basically you have these Dirac delta jumps uh, spaced by A. And uh, so uh, the form mathematically of that potential, it's basically the sum of Dirac deltas uh, with a factor alpha. And uh, well, you have a finite number of uh, spikes because under the assumption of the circular lattice chain, you basically bend the cable into itself. And so you only need n atoms to generate that situation, right? So, I mean, of course you have an as in order of Borgato's number, but the point is that it's finite and we're assuming a decircular structure. So, um, yeah, I mean, the first and last points are conjoined as in this uh, circular lattice assumption. And uh, we're going to focus on the Schrodinger equation in the interval 0a and then conclude some other things by translation. Um, so the point, of course, is that given the form that I chose, uh, the Dirac delta only manifests at the boundaries, right? I mean, you know the deal with the Dirac deltas. So actually, only at the boundaries 0 and a, you would have this infinite force effect. But for the sake of uh, the argument in the open interval 0a, excluding the boundaries, the boundary of the Dirac delta is zero. So you only have the kinetic energy in Schrodinger equation in that subinterval and open, open subinterval. So of course, what you can do is to reformulate this in a simple way that looks like a, a basically um, harmonic equation, uh, has an LDE. And if you basically define K as the square root of 2mv divided by h bar, as you're already familiar, which basically would be by passing this factor to the other side, you can express the equation above as the second derivative of phi equal to minus k squared phi. So that clearly looks like something that can be solved in terms of sines and cosines, as you know from your ODE's course. And so, okay, solution, sum of sines and cosines, uh, where you have a frequency k, and you're of course in the subinterval open zero a. And so now you're gonna use Bloch's theorem, right? Um, so basically, let's say that you're considering actually the subinterval minus a is zero. So from Bloch's theorem and the use, you will have one phase factor due to the translation, and then uh, psi of x plus a. Now, the important thing is that x belongs to, in this case, minus a zero. So x plus a belongs to zero a, right? And uh, think of the translation, just think about. In that case, x plus a actually um, is represented by the solution with the form as we know it here. And so, okay, if we want to still capture what happens in the other interval by translation, in the interval minus a zero, you have the phase factor and then times the form of the solution in zero a, which is why you're evaluating x plus a in the, which belongs to the interval zero a, and then you have the form of this function, but evaluated at x plus a. So, so far so good. Translation and use of uh, the wave function form already known in the other interval. Um, so the wave function must be continuous. So we'll impose the continuity conditions uh, basically in the limit at x uh, going to zero, either from the left or to the right. So basically on the right, we know that the wave function has this form. On the left, we know that the wave function is of this form. So, and the function, the wave function must be continuous at zero. So, okay, this is the form in basically um, 
the right or approaching from the right, uh, this other is the form approaching from the left. Of course, in the limit as x approaches zero where you can actually evaluate both. So if you were to evaluate this one, uh, well, the sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one, so that's why you have b. And on these other things also simplify, right? So, but, well, although uh, here you have the a, so simply what you have is the phase factor times a sine of ka plus b cosine of k. Um, now, what you have to think also is that you have a potential which is given by Dirac deltas. And so that is going to cause a discontinuity in the derivative. Um, actually going to use a result of one of the earlier problems in Griffiths, but essentially it's basically to jump some calculations, but um, the discontinuity uh, due to the Dirac delta in the derivative is basically given by this. And if you actually look at that discontinuity by evaluating the limit of the derivative at zero from, uh, both from the left and the right. If you look at the jump, which is basically the difference between the derivative of the uh, derivative approaching zero from the right minus approaching from the left, that would be equal to this. So perhaps the number is not that important except for the fact that it's showing the proportionality constant starting in the potential, which kind of makes sense, right? I mean the stronger you basically make this potential in terms of Dirac deltas with this constant of proportionality, uh, the more the derivative will be discontinuous. So this is basically a discontinuity condition of the derivative for the case of a Dirac delta potential uh, that is making its effect in the boundaries. And this is measuring the magnitude. Um, so, uh, well, okay, this is basically given to simplify uh, some calculations, but I still want to calculate um, this equation explicitly for uh, the forms of the function that I have, because as in any basically PV's problem with boundary conditions, what I want to find is eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues will be given by uh, proceeding with the related system of equations. So, okay, so far I know uh, the form of the derivative in each one of these intervals. At zero a, I have this typical function. So I just take derivative and then uh, fix a factor of k. Then you have a cosine, of course, and then minus b sine. Uh, so, so far, so good. In the other one, at minus a is zero, I already know the form of the function over here. So I simply take derivatives. So I still have the phase factor and I have a uh, derivative of at x plus a, where I will use the knowledge in the other sub-interval, right? So um, I'm gonna jump a little bit of a step, but because what I know is the discontinuity at zero between uh, approaching the left and the right is this factor. So that part is still the same. This other is computed explicitly, um, where this one of course would have this form because it's related to the other. So I'm simply gonna plug in. So this part from the right, of course, is this function evaluated at zero. On the other, which is basically the limit of the derivative from the left uh, at zero. So I still have the phase factor. And then the form, of this one, of this function evaluated at zero uh, with the translation of x plus a, right? So, um, well, that would basically give me um, this function. The, so, do, 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 yeah, so I still have this function. And then if I evaluate, let's think uh, what I would get. So on one hand, for this one, I have basically cosine of zero, that is one, then sine of zero is zero, so that's why I only have the ka. On this other part, I have the phase factor, and then I have k, and then I have to evaluate x at zero. So that would be a cosine of Ka minus B sine of Ka, and that's zero. So, um, well, we're getting there in terms of the system of equation. It might be easier. You'll see some simplifications will happen, but what we can do is uh, from the first equation that we got, uh, express a sine of Ka in terms of B. Uh, so basically, um, uh, oh, where am I? Okay. 
Yeah, so if you put in terms of uh, a sine of k, you have a sine of k equal to b exponential of i to a minus cosine of uh, ka. So that is basically starting from this equation, passing the b cosine ka to the other side and factorizing. And well, actually you need first to pass this phase factor to the other side. Uh, so uh, doo -doo -doo, let's see. Um, okay, let me continue. So what I'll do is that now I will uh, basically um, substitute this in my previous equation, but I will multiply by sine of k because what happens is that on this side, I have the a's, here I have the b, uh, some things will simplify where I will aim to use this equation and then you'll go. So, okay, multiply this equation by sine of Ka, then you have minus exponential of this, uh, blah, 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 times K, then A sine of Ka, so okay, it's getting uh, the shape that we want. And then basically, um, oh, where am I? Uh, yeah, so, Okay, I multiply the b by the sine of ka, so that's why I have uh, sine squared of ka. And here I have the sine of ka with the, this factor. Now, why have I done this? Well, okay. Um, so this is because I have a formula for a sine of ka. And uh, I will substitute it. Uh, I will uh, basically use it here. And things simplify. So. Here we have KB and this uh, difference between the exponential and the cosine. Then I have exponential of uh, minus IQA times K. Then I use uh, this part from this other formula over here, but still have the factor of cosine of KA over this part. And well, this simplifies minus B sine squared of KA. So, um, well, okay, this is good because on one hand, um, I have put everything in terms of B. In fact, I can take B out of the equation because it's everywhere uh, and with the same degree. And also, well, you could pass K to the other side dividing because these two terms have a common factor of K. So basically by passing KB, which is appearing over here, the B will disappear, then you'll have the factor of K and then you can still rearrange some things, but it, we're getting there, I mean, it doesn't seem evident from the beginning that you will get a simplification, but you do. So, so far so good. Um, actually, what you'll notice is that you have a factor uh, B of IQA minus cosine of K on these two terms, so you can factorize. And if you factorize, then you have the one minus, and then this phase factor, and then still with the factor of cosine of Ka. And in fact, um, well, because this phase factor is also affecting the sine squared, you have minus minus with a plus phase factor sine squared. So, okay. Um, again, it wouldn't seem uh, that would simplify, but it does. And the way to do it is actually to basically take out as a um, constant in the left-hand side this common factor. And that will help us actually to recognize this as uh, the square of this. Well, this one equal to this one times a factor and then you will square. So if you factorize by exponential of minus IQA, then well, you pick up basically the opposite factor which multiplies in here, which gives you this same other term. And this is why you would get exponential of IQA minus cosine KA squared. And then here you have only plus sine squared. And this part stays the same. Now we're gonna apply the squares and things are gonna further simplify. So if you do that, basically it's a binomial theorem, have the square of this one, the square of this one minus double product. And then you have this. Well, this is neat because this simplifies to one, so we're good. And in this other, you have exponential of i to qa minus two cosine ka exponential of iqa. Uh, this hasn't changed. And then if you multiply the phase factor that was uh, factorizing everything, then you have exponential of iqa and this other part disappears and then minus cosine or two cosine of K. And then you have 
exponential of minus IQA. Now, the nice thing is that you can group these two terms uh, that will give you a cosine if you divide by two. And the new thing is also that you have a factor of two on this part. So if you divide by two and you group these two over here, you have basically E plus, uh, plus E minus over two, which is cosine of the argument. So you have cosine of QA, and then you have a factor of two over here, which you already took out. Um, that's why you have minus cosine of K, and this has only taken out a factor of two. And just expressing what we got, actually it's simplified to cosine of QA minus cosine of KA equal to this factor times sine of K, and you have K in the denominator. So it did indeed simplify. Um, so, uh, well, we have to think about what we got. So actually we will obtain many results from this equation or in the equivalent form of passing this term to the other side. So cosine of QA equal to cosine of K plus this factor involving K times the sine of K. And again, as I mentioned mathematically, this is basically an equation for the eigenvalues. Mm. Excuse me, I need to drink some water because I get thirsty after talking too much. And so what you're getting is basically this equation that will give you the allowed values of K. Think of it as the way to obtain the eigenvalues from a transcendental equation. And most importantly, we will see from this equation that not all values of K are allowed. So that's important for the purpose of bind energies. So the point is, okay, this is independent of K all these two terms depend on K, these two, but not only this is independent of K, but actually this is a cosine. And so this is of magnitude less or equal to one. Whereas here, you have the sum of these two terms. So, okay, this is a cosine, but here you have basically sine of K A divided by K, and then you have something um, uh, involving alpha. And if alpha was big enough, clearly at some point, the magnitude of this side for some values of K would be much greater than one. And so the values of K for which the magnitude of this is greater than one won't be allowed because there is no way they can satisfy the equation. In no way for that situation, this would be equal to a cosine because the magnitude of the cosine is less or equal to one. So perhaps to make the analysis simpler, we can define some constants or at least uh, some new variable we define C as Ka, which is basically the argument of these periodic functions, cosine and sine, and beta as a constant because, okay, you're gonna put things in terms of Ka, you might as well have a Ka and put things in nice form. So we'll see how this happens. So basically cosine of Qa, which is a constant independent of K, is equal to function of C, where the function of C is the form of cosine of C, yeah, because that's the variable I introduced, uh, C equal to Ka, plus beta sine of C over C. So this is basically, you have sine of K divided by Ka, the resulting beta is what you would have here. That's why it picks up a factor of A. But okay, the analysis is simpler just because we're in this uh, dimensionalized version. And we want to find the values of C equal to Ka that satisfy the equation. Again, the same argument, basically this is a cosine, a cosine constant of magnitude less or equal to one. And actually we know the values of Q, but now we might all go into that into detail. And this is a function that perhaps can take values greater than one if say alpha is big enough, etc., which can happen, then not all values will be allowed. I mean, in fact, even if perhaps alpha was not so big, you might end up with an unlucky situation, I mean, this function is basically the result of adding a cosine with sine of z over z, right? So sine of z over z is this function that you already know, uh, basically the sinc function, which at zero is one, and then it oscillates decaying, right? To pseudo towards infinity. Um, but nevertheless, there can be combinations of values of c for which this is still is greater than one and or in magnitude, and it will satisfy the equation. So for that case, uh, the values of C or equivalent to the values of K would be forbidden. And that would mean that you would have basically forbidden energies because when we change the problem from the energies to K, 
in our change of variables, uh, the E is representing an energy. So basically, the allowed values of K represent uh, equivalent the bands of allowed energy C of K, and they are separated by forbidden energy gaps. Uh, so this is where I go more into detail in terms of the values of QA. So we already had figured the allowed values of Q, uh, sorry. Um, over here. So I'm going to use that. And equivalently, I can express this as QA equal to 2 pi n divided by big N, where n equals 0, plus 1, minus 1, etc. Now, n is of the order of a Bogatus number. So what you can do is to basically analyze the different cases, right? And so on one hand, you know that because you have a cosine for QA, no matter the value of this stuff, the magnitude is always going to be less or equal than 1. Explicitly, this is cosine of 2 pi n divided by big N, or capital N. So think of the cases, right? For n equals 0, this cosine of 2 pi n over n is basically cosine of 0, which is 1. So that would be the value of cosine of QA for n equals 0, because essentially the Q is dependent on n. Um, for the case, let's say n equal to uh, capital N over 2, what you would have is that cosine of 2 pi n divided by capital N is equal to cosine of pi, and that is minus 1. So you're basically going from 1 to minus 1 by going from 0 to n over 2. And if you continue basically getting almost to n, let's say at n minus 1, you have cosine of 2 pi n divided by capital N, then you have cosine of 2 pi 1 minus 1 over n. And now, 1 over n is very small because n is of the order of 10 to the 23. So basically, uh, this is almost like cosine of 2 pi. So you still have something smaller, but very close to the value of 1. And so you basically have oscillated between the possible values for the allowed Qs from 1 to minus 1 and then almost back to 1. The reason you're excluding the case n equal to capital N because is because this would be equivalent to exactly the same case. I mean, for n equal to capital N, you go exactly to cosine of 2 pi, which is cosine of 0, which is 1. So, and that's actually the case where you are joining the first and the last atom on your chain and bending it to make the lattice uh, circular uh, chain. So that's why you're not counting n equal to capital N. So, um, well, the point is that for each one of these cases of cosine of uh, QA, you have to find the values of C equal uh, KA that satisfy this equality, right? So basically you have different values of cosine of QA that are basically oscillating between one and minus one. And uh, although they are finite, of course, and then you need to find the intersections of values of C for each one. Um, so, um, okay, so far so good. I'm at least indicating how to find the eigenvalues. Again, I don't need to consider n equal to capital N because that would be the same as the case n equals zero at that point. So summarizing what we're doing, we're basically obtaining that there will be values of C equal to Ka for which this function is basically of magnitude greater than one. And so these values of C or equivalent the values of K will be forbidden. Now, the point is that each value of Q of N defines an allowed uh, band of values k that are allowed or equivalently allowed energy c of k for which f of c satisfies this equation right cosine of qa which is cosine of 2 pi n by by big n equal to f of c with the form that i gave in terms of these variables where c is equal to k so actually just to illustrate a little bit i will show the other figure from prefits don't completely like the diagram, but at least I want to show qualitatively what happens. So basically, um, let's think that you give an arbitrary value for beta as we found it like 10, right? So this would be the shape of f of c um, that was defined over here, the same function that we have. And for values of beta uh, or value of beta equal to 10, this is the form of f of c. It kind of makes sense because look, it's made by the combination of a cosine and then a sinc function, sine of c over z, times the beta factor. So, of course, if beta has been chosen by 10, since this term is equal to 1, sine of c over c, at uh, z approaching 0, and then cosine of 0 is 1, 
the nominating term is going to be the one with the factor beta because it's 10. So that's why you are basically far away from the maximum. But um, this is f of c. So, okay, uh, basically the sink term starts to decay as c gets bigger and the dominating term uh, starts to become the cosine. So that one, the cosine is between one minus one, but this one is not. Uh, um, so, well, you'll have the factor of C. So there is at least a neighborhood, especially when multiplying. So with the factor beta, it's not. I mean, with sine of C over C, you are inside. But, uh, well, basically, as you get C bigger, you start to decay. But the point is that F of C has to be equal to cosine of uh, QA, uh, as we found here. And so the point is that there will be values of K or C equivalently with C equal to uh, KA that will not satisfy the equation because especially basically when they have values of magnitude greater than one, they are not allowed. So qualitatively, at least, the figure is showing what's happening. So the regions that are not shaded, like these ones, correspond to values where f of c is of magnitude greater than one. And therefore, they cannot present a solution to uh, the equality with cosine of uh, QA. So like this one, right? I mean, these are points where the magnitude is greater than one. The shaded regions, on the other hand, they are presenting values of K. You cannot see them because they are small and they're discrete, discrete. but at least these are uh, solutions for which um, the values of K are such that F of C is of magnitude greater or equal to one. And so what you have then, it's basically uh, these n intersections with cosine of QA, where you have n Qs, n meaning the order of Avogadro's number, as many nuclei you have. And so there are as many, so basically the shaded region looks like a continuum, but still um, there are discrete values. But this is telling you that essentially, given the form of F of C that you have here, you have allowed values for K and forbidden values of K. And this equivalently translates between allowed values of the energy and allowed forbidden energies, so uh, which is represented here. So I have to go into more detail for that. Um, so, okay, at least I get the qualitative picture of what happens. You cannot see the intersections of the horizontal lines because there are many, as many as Avogadro's number. But, um, okay, let me continue. So again, each value of Q defines an allowed band of values of K. Um, actually, um, yeah, well, I guess I would like to express this actually. Um, and of course, I mean, the case are related to allowed energies. And again, uh, the quality that needs to be satisfied is cosine of two pi n over n equal to f of c. So this is my QA, where Q is dependent on, on n. Uh, so uh, basically what you have is that each uh, so-called band is made by n states um, given by the respective intersections of f of c with these ones. So the point is that you have capital N values uh, with N going from zero to capital N minus one. So these are the cosine of QAs that you need to intersect with the F of C. And in the shaded regions, what you are looking at is basically um, like a faraway version of these N intersections as many as Avogadro's number. So formally speaking, you have a finite discrete set of intersections, but there are so many that it looks like a continuum from outside. And that also translates actually um, uh, basically to the energies, which I will say in a second. But okay, these intersections uh, are basically concentrated along the a given region in the c-axis. So here what you have are those N intersections where you go from minus one to one, as we mentioned. And uh, yeah, you have 
uh, basically these are intersections within the Avogadro's number, but there are so many. So you're looking at it as a completely shaded region. And well, again, because they are so closely spaced as there are so many, they sometimes are thought of as a continuum. But the important point is that the energies depend on K on this form, right? When we made the change of variable to completely look at this as a harmonic equation, um, basically this is the form on the energy. So allowed values of K are equivalently represented as allowed energies. So here what we presented are basically the allowed Ks, which are shaded, which are n order of Avogadro's number intersections. And then I go to the energy map, right? Because, okay, K is ascending. Let's say that I start here. So this is a monotonic map. And so I have allowed values of K, forbidden values of K, because they cannot satisfy the quality as in any eigenvalue um, equation determined by a transcendental equation. And the cool thing would happen basically where you have the bands of allowed energies, which again are discrete, but they're like so closely spaced that they kind of like approximate um, as a continuum. And then the gaps uh, made of forbidden energies. Uh, so this is basically the way the energy eigenvalues would look like. Um, okay, let's go back to this. So, so far we have basically studied the Schrodinger equation, but we have to think how the uh, ND electrons are gonna fill our available states. Uh, where, okay, N, because we have N nuclei or N atoms, and then the basically counting for the number of free uh, electrons for each atom. Uh, so we're again, as in last lecture, basically gonna apply Pauli exclusion principle for fermions, meaning that only two electrons are allowed in a given spatial state, uh, if you consider the spin again. And well, usually the, the number of free electrons per atom is very low. I can take values as one, two or three, for example. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, before we continue the analysis, just have to mention that although we made many approximations starting from the dimensionality of the problem, we're starting to see at least some features, right? Basically allowed energies and forbidden energies, which is uh, giving you the theory of uh, energy band gaps, but uh, never mind. Uh, let's continue. So again, basically mathematically, uh, what we did is find the eigenvalues by solving a transcendental equation. So, okay. Let's say that for the moment we have filled uh, the bands with our ND electrons, right? So, and think of the basically energy at the top. Let's assume it's this one, right? Uh, that is filled. So basically, let's assume that that energy band uh, at the top uh, is only partially filled. So because the spacing between these levels is very small, as you can see from the figure, uh, basically, it's easy to give very small energies to, say, the electron at the top in terms of energies and make it jump to the next level. And so that is actually um, explaining kind of like the behavior of metals, because you only need little energies to excite the electron and to move it to the next energy level. So what happens in that case is that that metal is basically going to conduct electric charge. Now, the opposite case would be when uh, the top band is totally full because in order to excite, say, uh, let's assume that we are here, right? I mean, well, or let's assume that we're here. So let's say that we have the top band and it's completely full. So there's gonna be a next level, but it's empty. But if we want to take the electron at say the top energy to the next available level, you have to overcome the energy gap of forbidden energies. And so that is considerably much bigger in principle than the little uh, separation between energies within a band. So that is gonna take a lot of energy in order to make it conductive. And that is basically the behavior of insulators because you need a lot of energy to move the electrons to the next level. Um, so, uh, well, that's in principle how you would explain the insulator um, but uh, there can be one intermediate case actually, where let's assume that, uh, for example, this energy gap and the, 
electron uh, at the top was here. So this one was empty for the sake of the argument. If the gap was relatively small by the nature of basically the eigenvalue equation that you would have to solve, then perhaps the energy that you need to give an electron at the top to move to the next available level in the other band might not be that big. So that of course depends on the feature of the problem and of course on the feature of the particular material that you're considering. But in the case, the energy band gap was not that big of an intermediate level that actually would explain semiconductors because you wouldn't need that much of an energy to basically make the electron jump to uh, the next uh, energy band. So just some simple examples of semiconductors are basically silicon, which is very common in nature and also for experimental use and also germanium. Um, so just, you know, as a comment, basically the energy band gap for semiconductors is usually less than four electron volts. So the important thing is that at this point with the result of the eigenvalue equation that we solve for the simplified potential, although it's not the most um, realistic case, either for the dimensionality of the material uh, or for the potential, um, what we have done is to actually show qualitatively how the phenomena of band gaps arises from Bloch's theory for periodic potentials, uh, which result in the basically periodic Schrodinger problem uh, for which we have solved an eigenvalue uh, equation and for which uh, the related allowed and forbidden energies are giving us the band gaps um, as for say metals, insulators, or uh, semiconductors. So the point is that you cannot predict the band gap theory by the free electron gas model of Sommerfeld. So you cannot only assume that the electrons move freely as in metals without any uh, interaction potential with the nuclei. So you need Bloch's theory for periodic potentials in order to predict again the energy bands and the gaps of forbidden energies as well as, the, as this uh, different material behaviors between uh, metals, insulators, and semiconductors. And the hope of this lecture was to at least present qualitatively the way this arises from the eigenvalue problem of uh, periodic uh, potential in Schrodinger equation. So I hope that has been helpful uh, for the figures. I recommend to take a second look at Griffiths. Um, yeah, basically this is the end of the module on identical particles and also the end on the considerations of solids and origin of their band structure. Uh, for this part, particularly of solids and origin of band structure, I have used Griffiths and also some uh, notes of my undergraduate course on atomic and condensed matter physics. Um, but yeah, this would be the end. I hope uh, you're excited of uh, learning qualitatively. This is a theory of basically energy band structure in solids. And uh, well, good luck uh, with the rest of the week. I'll talk to you very soon.